name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Last Sunday, as I was leaving church, I looked at my gas gauge and saw that I was pretty low, so I decided to stop at a nearby gas station to fill up. And as I was there, I reflected on what filling up a tank of gasoline looked like about a year ago. Early in the COVID pandemic, we were hyper aware of everything we touched. I remember particularly the trip that I took back to Houston to be with my parents as I drove to Atlanta on the first leg and then all the way from Atlanta to Houston on the second because I had a safe place to stay in Atlanta by myself. And at every filling station, that's what we call them in Texas, I'm not sure if y'all call them that here, I was hyper aware of where my hands were, which hands were touching what, and I had a box of blue latex gloves on the floor of my car for ready access and hand sanitizer and wipes if that wasn't enough. There was a real fear of contracting COVID. And so early in the process, we weren't sure how one got it. So selecting produce at the grocery store became a negotiation of space and place and proximity to others. Shaking hands, which we took for granted, became taboo. And even within our social bubbles that we formulated just beyond our own household, we kept our physical distance. Over the past 15 months, we have missed touching one another. In Mark's gospel, touching equated to healing. Touching equated to healing. In chapter one, the very first healing act that Jesus performed was after being in the synagogue, after having called the fishermen away from their nets and their boats to follow him. He went into the house of Peter and Andrew, whose mother was ill. And Jesus simply reached out his hand and took hers, and her fever left her. Now, we remember the part of the story where she immediately got up and was expected to serve everybody. But the part Mark wanted us to focus on was the power of healing in the touch. And in today's couplet, the touching happened in two different ways. The woman who had been sick for 12 years is the one who initiated the contact. She reached out and simply touched the fringe of Jesus' cloak, and she was healed. Later in the story, when Jesus went to Jairus' house, the leader of the synagogue, because his daughter was ill, Jesus simply took her hand and instructed her to get up, and she did. Perhaps through this lens of our own pandemic experience, the importance, the impact of touch might feel stronger right now in this place and in this time, might resonate more than it ever has before. And if we forget what this feels like, then it ever will again. The physical act of touching, the importance of connection, was so evident in Jesus' journey through Mark's gospel. But what might not be evident to our non-Hebrew ears is another layer 
and it's in these stories, this one conjoined couplet today. We're told that the woman had a hemorrhage for 12 years. The word used for that blood flow is the same word used in Leviticus when it was outlining what ritual purity and impurity looked like. It said, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond that time, all the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanness, eyes, shall be treated as a bed of impurity, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean, and whoever touches those things shall be unclean. This unnamed woman was ritually, not morally, ritually unclean for 12 years, disconnected from community, disconnected from her place of worship, the temple, and disconnected from touch. We have been disconnected from touch for give or take 12 months. We have been desperate might be an understatement to get reconnected. This woman was disconnected for 12 years. Her act was one of faith, but more than that, one of desperate hope to restore wholeness in the power of touching Jesus. But her act was also subversive. We like being subversive at Church of the Servant, don't we? This subversive act in her time and place would have made Jesus unclean. So when he stopped and said, who touched me? She wouldn't have known what his reaction was going to be when she fearfully stepped forward and told the whole truth but he didn't admonish her. He called her daughter. He adopted her as family and said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. The other healing story has some similarities. We see the desperation of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, certainly somebody who was used to getting what he expected, not in stark contrast to the unnamed woman that we heard earlier. And yet he may have known that the Pharisees were already plotting against Jesus. And so his reaching out as a leader of the synagogue was probably a risky thing. But at that point, he was desperate, and for any who have children or children that they love, that desperation of, what do I have to lose, resonates. And he asked Jesus simply to come and lay his hands on his daughter so that she might be well. And on the way, they learn that his daughter had died. But Jesus wouldn't be deterred. He not only pressed on, he took a few of his guys with him, Peter and James and John. But again, to the Hebrew ear, they would have said, hey, wait a minute, here we go again. Jesus is breaking a ritual, purity rule. Those who touch a dead body of any human being are ritually unclean for seven days. And not just them, but anyone who is in the place where that body is lying. But Jesus consistently put human connection and healing ahead of all those rules. Restoring wholeness of self 
and to community was the highest priority and revealing that God's healing grace is intended for all people. A 12-year-old girl, an unnamed woman who's been suffering for 12 years, and even the synagogue leader who was desperate on behalf of his daughter. And while this woman and the leader of the synagogue seemed to have little in common, they both stepped out contrary to social and religious norms. They both put aside their fears and believed in Jesus' power to restore wholeness. And they both were touched by God's love through Christ. As a result, they received new life, not free from hardship, but one that had a formula for facing the challenges that they would still encounter. It comes in Jesus' words to Jairus, do not fear, only believe. Over the past 15 months, we have each faced challenges. We've navigated them differently. The challenges I've faced are certainly different than the challenges you faced or you faced or you faced or you faced. But they are no less real and no less legitimate challenges of disconnection. But I hope beyond hope that our trust and belief as followers of Jesus have allowed us to face those challenges with less fear, if not no fear. And that our partnership with God allowed us to continue and continues to invite us to put love for neighbor ahead of everything else. That's what we're called to do. Do not fear, only believe. Amen.